so photorealistic drawings to me, um, I, you know, I'll, I'll admit it's neat, you know, and I understand the appeal behind them. And uh, I even uh, believe that there's a certain level of skill that can be developed from, from, you know, doing that. But at a certain point, uh, I think it becomes, I don't want to say gimmicky, but it can become very stale very easily because what the fun of art is, is being able to create your own world and putting your own opinion on things. You know, maybe you're, you're studying from life or something and the light's not strong enough in real life. And you say, you know, what? I'm just going to push the light just a little bit further, make it more dramatic. You know, when you start taking those, um, that thought process away, it ends up feeling, um, it ends up feeling, uh, half baked, if you will. And so, um, is, can it be helpful? Sure. But I, I really think that when you start taking away those elements that make art enjoyable and, and make it your own, then that's when you really have to start being careful. And, um, and it's very easy to get sucked up into that sort of thing. <laughs> so especially in an online community like YouTube or Facebook or whatever. All right. In the chat. Wow. We've got a lot of comments. Ashley is saying, Realistic drawing depends on the subject matter, whether it's boring or not. Rendering something perfectly should really be adding to the overall meaning of the artwork in a significant way, otherwise it's boring. Oh, Mary actually just watched the video. Okay, Mary, I'd really like to hear what your opinion is on the portfolio, because I think what bums me out a little bit is hearing that people are looking at this portfolio and feeling like, oh, geez, I have no chance of getting into art school if this portfolio is so technically accomplished, I should just quit now. That bums me out because it's not a good feeling and I want people to feel that they should give it a shot. So Jordan, what would you say to somebody who watches Andy's portfolio critique? If you guys want to know where it is, just look for the thumbnail that has these oranges in it. What would you say to somebody who watches this critique and says, oh, God, they're so much better than I'm ever going to be. This makes me feel terrible about myself. Um, what I would say is join the club because <laughs> pretty much every artist, every athlete, every musician, everyone who's ever wanted to achieve something great in life has, for the most part, had someone before them who's maybe done it better or um, excel despite all the odds and the, and the chips stacked against them. And so uh, this is where, you know, self-will comes in and you have to almost will yourself to greatness if that's something that you want to do. And it'd be really a shame to let some YouTube video discourage you from pursuing a, a life in art, you know, whether it's our video or anyone else's. And it's it actually kind of hurts um, to think that someone, just because someone else is so talented and so skilled, um, that you want to step away from that. And I don't know if it's because of a competition type thing or, you know, just, you know, they started before me or whatever it is, but I've seen over and over again, people who start from zero and will themselves, themselves to greatness in just a matter of months, let alone years. So, well, so we have yeah. this statement from Luna one, who we're going to look at in a few minutes, because we actually also did a portfolio critique for Luna as well. And she's somebody who was the queen of photorealism. <laughs> she did so much in terms of photorealistic drawings. And she said one of the reasons she used to do it all the time is because people used to always give their best compliments anytime she did something photorealistically. And she said there was one time she was playing around with doing some drawings that were a little bit more gestural, a little bit looser. And she said her friends were actually joking to her, oh, you lost all your drawing technique. You don't know how to draw anymore. And so there is sort of this public opinion of photorealism that people just inherently believe it's just a lot better than everything else. In the chat, Anthony is saying, as a craft, photorealism oftentimes is impressive. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what Luna is saying, is that when people look at a picture like this, they instantly say, wow, I am super impressed. This person's a really, really good artist. But it's not everything. Milky Punch is saying, seeing art by other people who are the same age as me, seeing how good they are, pushes me to practice more. Jordan, what do you think about that? I like that. I mean, if there are plenty of people who I go to school with who are my age or even younger than me, and they are killing it. Like every single time I go over to their workstation, I'm like, dang how they do that 
And, um, you know, usually in those situations, they're willing to help me get to their level. They'll, they'll give me tips and stuff like that. But you have to let that stuff push you forward and not, you know, hold you back. Because um, in, in a situation like mine, we're all going to be kind of working in the same field, in the same industry. And those are potentially going to be my colleagues at some point. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to end my career before it starts just because I'm jealous of someone else's stuff. So um, letting that inspire you, I think, is the best way to go about it. And that's for anything in life. My feeling about technique is that if you work hard enough and you log the hours, you can get to a point where you can draw photorealistically pretty competently. But you know what I have accepted, Jordan? No matter what quote unquote level, whatever that's supposed to mean, I get to in my realistic drawing skills there's going to be at least one other person who is better at it than me. There just is going to be that. And, and you know, when you get to my age and you've taught as long as I have, chances are it's one of my students who can do it better than me. And that's just sort of humbling <laughs> to be like, oh, you're half my age and you're drawing way better than I ever can. And so I think you have to accept that and you have to ask yourself, okay, well, what can I do as an artist that maybe somebody with that skill set cannot do. Because really, we're here to share our own voices. We're here to say what we care about. And like, Jordan, for you, what can you talk about that nobody else on the planet can talk about in your way? In my way? Um, pro probably Spider-Man. No, uh, <laughs> well, that too. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, no, uh, when it comes to art, you know, maybe figure drawing. Um, very few people can talk about it the same way as me. Um, maybe my approach to character design. Um, and, you know, those, those are just the two off the top of my head. And not to say that I'm the only one who could talk about that because you could find plenty of other people. But um, I think everyone has their own unique spin. So <laughs> Let's see. Mary is saying technical aspect of art is incredibly impressive and pleasing to look at. But I think it's much harder to learn how to transform art and make it your own. That's a great word, Mary. I really like that you use the word transform because really what I'm interested in as an artist is interpretation. And I feel that a lot of photorealistic images, they're really more copying than they are interpreting. And you don't really see a lot of the artist's voice because I don't know about you, Jordan, but if I'm trying to draw a photorealistic image, it's almost like being on automatic pilot because I don't have to make any choices. Like if I am working on a drawing, actually sometimes what matters more is what I choose not to draw. Because if you draw photorealistically, the assumption is you're gonna draw everything to the craziest amount of detail you possibly can, and you don't choose what to emphasize or what to de-emphasize because that's what distinguishes us from say somebody who's an electrician or a plumber, we get to pick, we get to say, I don't wanna draw that. I am more interested in this. The plumber can't do that. He's gotta fix the pipe, right? <laughs> like you can't be like, I choose right. to not fix this pipe. And so we have a choice to decide what we want to draw. So let's take a look at, for example, this is Tony Janello, who was one of my most beloved former professors where I went to art school. And it's really interesting, I think, to compare Luna's images of this portrait versus Tony's. Okay, so this is Luna's close-up drawn from a photo of an eye. And now here's Tony's drawing of an eye. I know, unfair to compare an art school student to an art professor, but still, we're trying to really drive this home. Jordan, what's the difference between this eye drawn by Tony from direct observation and Luna's, which is drawn from a photo. There's something in life that cannot be replicated in a photo. Um, there's there's a spark there. And I don't even know if I could put it into words, but I feel like every artist who's experienced to a certain extent will know what I'm talking about. And especially when you're trying to paint something or draw something as realistically as this. Um, but the form, the understanding of form is much more clear in Tony's drawing. Uh, the the emotion behind it, the colors that is being chosen, uh, the way the pencil strokes are working, like it's just uh, it just looks. I don't want to say painstaking because it actually looks like he's he rather enjoyed it, but <laughs> there's something about it that just has so much love 
uh, placed into this little piece of the drawing versus the other one, it just feels, um, st- I don't want to say stale because it, it's still a, d- a decent drawing, but it definitely has a life that's missing from it that's hard to, it, it's like you can't really put your finger on it, but there's just something lacking. And um, I don't want to repeat myself, but that, yeah, that's how I feel. <laughs> I mean, my feeling is the difference is that because Tony drew this portrait from life, he got to meet the person. He spent time with him and spoke to him and they developed a relationship as artist and model. Luna never met this person. By the way, I don't know who this is. It's probably some young hip celebrity that I have no idea. So if you know who this is, just let us know in the chat. But that's all the difference in the world. So let's take a look at some of my drawings because I have the same thing where I have one model that I work with who I've known for a very long time. And I think that goes into the work. When you know the person personally, you can really show that. Oh, wow, we got a lot in the chat. I'm going to do the best I can, but I'm sorry if I have to skip over your comment. Let's see. Kareth is saying practice is pure time and patience. Ideas are more important and harder to develop. Absolutely. I mean, Jordan, don't you feel like with figure drawing, it's just a matter of logging the hours? Yes. Well, the, yes. And also you have to learn some actual stuff like where the muscles are. But a lot of it, the, the most enjoyable drawings are when you can kind of just turn your mind off just a little bit and just go for it and log in all those hours for sure. Let's see. Um, WES is saying it's hard. It will eventually come out sooner or later. It will take time. But for those who are hopeless that they're afraid they can't go to art school, it's not the end of the world. There's so many options. I mean, Jordan, when I was a teen, there was no internet. (laughs) Like you had to go to the library and check out a book then read it and try to figure stuff out. I mean, I just think to myself all the time, my goodness, my life would have been so different if I'd had the internet. I think people have options now they just did not have a long time ago. Let's see, 10,000 Crows is saying, I'm glad you guys talk about this. I didn't really think about this very much before I found your channel so important. The concept of making choices in art is so freeing. WES is saying, what do you say to professors saying that illustration is not art? Wow. Um, okay, I disagree. <laughs> and number two, let's do a stream on that because I think that's a whole other universe. And I would love to talk about that because Jordan, I think you've probably heard something a little bit similar in the past. Oh, definitely. For sure. Okay, so let's take a look at some of my drawings. So this is a step-by-step sequence from left to right of how I developed the series of drawings that I did in 2016. So in the upper left-hand corner, that's the original reference photo that I shot of the artist model. And I've known her since I was 19. In fact, Jordan, you might actually know her. She, I think she was a model when you were in art school, too. Yeah, I recognize her. Yeah. So anyway, her. if you look at that, you have the reference photo. And then I actually turn the reference photo black and white because it makes it easier for me to draw from it. And then you see a quick sketch. And then there is a close up where I make the drawing very detailed. And then I actually end up ripping the drawing and almost creating this paper sculpture in the end. And so... I am blanking on who said this earlier, but whoever said that you transform the image, I think this is a good example of that because a lot of my drawings, they go through a lot of stages. Like I don't just have the photo and then boom, all of a sudden I have the finished drawing. I really take the time to work on it for a little bit, come back, make some changes. So if you look at this slide, you would never know what photo this is done from because I ripped up the paper. I know people think I'm nuts for doing that but it worked out really well for me. (laughs) And I was very excited about the results. So that was really cool. And by the way, if you would like to see my process for making these, we do have these videos. Just go to the drawing tutorials playlist and you guys can find that there. So Jordan, why do you think meeting the person in real life matters? Because you've probably worked with so many models Do you ever speak to the models or have interaction with them beyond just I'm drawing you or? Uh, I don't like go out to lunch. Oh, no, no, no. That's inappropriate. (laughs) 
But um, more recently, I have um, built up connections, uh, especially because I started running some of the workshops uh, at, at my school. And, you know, that means I, you know, have to get them comfortable in the area. Like, hey, what kind of music do you like? And, you know, and I also see how others interact with them and making them and what that does interacting with them. It makes them less of an, a subject and more of a person. And I know it might sound weird, but when you know who the individual is, like really, and you may not know all their deepest, darkest secrets in their entire life story, but when you start to figure them out, it starts to inform um, your decisions about how you draw. Like, let's just say someone per perceive themselves perceives themselves as particularly strong or ultra masculine or something like that. I might have fun with that and just give them a super broad chest and big muscle, you know, and emphasize that a little bit more. Or maybe they saw themselves as shy and maybe I'll emphasize that more in the gesture or whatever the case may be. And so it's also a storytelling tool um, that I think is really helpful for me as a designer, uh, especially when I'm like creating characters or, or anything like that. And so, um, yeah, anytime you can get more information about someone, the better. Well, I mean, this nice. model who <laughs> I work with, I've known her for so long. She's modeled for my classes thousands of times. And it's like, I can tell you all about her. I can tell you that she's a very quiet, gentle person, that she has a very soft voice, that she does not talk very loud to the point where sometimes I'm like, I can't hear you. <laughs> but like, that's part of her personality. And it's like, if we go back to some of these images from Andy's portfolio, because we were looking at this image of the guy that was painting. I mean, this is definitely done from a photo. I can tell because it's so detailed and the pose of him holding a paintbrush up, you can't hold that for 24 hours. <laughs> There's no yeah. chance. And people ask me all the time, well, how do you know it's done from a photo? That's why. Because oftentimes it's like a drawing of somebody like leaping in midair and it's like super deep. I'm like, yeah, you, you can't pose something like that. <laughs> or oftentimes it's like a zoom in of an elephant. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think you have an elephant <laughs> that's going to pose for you. So oftentimes it, it's pretty clear that people are doing that. Oh, thanks for watching my videos, Tammy. I appreciate that. Yeah, I did a series on Hillary Clinton. Um, and you guys can take a look at that. That's in the exact same playlist that you'll find these other two videos in. Karen Lu's saying, I've not heard people say illustration's not art, but I've heard people say it's not fine art. Oh yeah, a lot we could dig into there. <laughs> Let's see. Asa is saying, there's a life to your drawing. I can really feel the model's emotion. I love the ripped up paper too. And Faux Turkey is saying, plus it looks flat when painted from a photo. Yeah, because if you look at this painting, guys, do you see how the background that those like wood panels, they're just as detailed as the stuff that's going on in the rest of the figure. So if we look at the figure's face, it's super detailed. If we look at the hand, it's super detailed. If we look at the clothing, it's super detailed. So what you can say from looking at this painting is that they're not making choices. They're just saying, okay, everything is detailed. Good. That's awesome. Now, Jordan, do you think you can make images that look realistic, but that are not photorealistic? Like, is there a difference to you? Or do you feel like it, realism is realism? Um, there is a difference. I mean, that that's when I think people start getting into a little bit of stylizing and uh, adding their own spin on things. Because uh, when I draw, I try to, I, I often stick to something that's more realistic, but it's very clear that it's not, you know, I'm not trying to do a paint by numbers method of just like, okay, their eyebrows such and such inches long. I'm not doing all that. Um, and for me, as long as it looks like a person, first of all, I'm not like some scary, you, you know, you know, morphing face. Um, and then if it looks like the person I'm trying to draw to, that's even better. And, um, I try not to put too much pressure on myself because there's usually a couple key elements that are very easy to see. Um, when I'm trying to draw someone that's familiar to most people like a celebrity um if i get those two or three elements down i'm fine but i can't i can't afford to stress myself out over you know not getting a drawing just perfectly photorealistic because it's first of all, i just don't have time for that for one and then two um i know that i'll live to draw another day you know at least so far <laughs> you know and so 
if I don't do a good drawing today, then we'll try again tomorrow or next week. And chances are I'll be much better for it. Yeah, I want to talk about the accuracy thing, because I actually think that sometimes the photorealistic version of your subject looks less like them than the mm -hmm. really messy gesture drawing, which is not very detailed at all. And so I think sometimes yeah. people equate details with realism, but actually it's not really the case sometimes. So this is me drawing Lauren Welch's cats. <laughs> we had a great time. And I did mm -hmm. all these drawings of her cats and I'm not a cat person. I mean, they're fine. I'm not obsessed with them <laughs> like half the internet. But one thing that I really liked about this is by the time we had finished filming the tutorial and we had logged the hours drawing her cats, I felt like I knew her cats. Like, I, I know what Tor is like. I know Tor is a diva and wants all the attention. Spicy is an old soul. Spicy was just lying around and Tor was a little bit of a spaz. And so my gesture drawings are really messy and sloppy, but I feel like I could have taken a photo of Tor and drawn it super realistically. And it might have been a less quote, accurate capturing of their personality. So details are definitely not everything that you can possibly do. Let's see, 10,000 Crows is asking, could you maybe explain when it would be more appropriate to use a photo or is it really better to always try to paint from life? All right, you're gonna take that one, Jordan. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, so, taking, so when, when you're drawing from life, like I said before, it's more about um, taking in everything. You know, you wanna get the, the feel of the entire environment and uh, understanding you know, the lighting and making those important decisions. And when you start um, doing things from photo, that starts to limit you oftentimes. And that's where you have to start making more all those decisions. And I think the key is to know when to make those decisions and when to put things in and when to leave things out. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's tough to say because I do both. You know, I'll draw or paint from photo or from life, depending on the situation. And it would be hypocritical of me to say that you can't, you know, do one or the other. Um, but I think as a more experienced artist, understanding when to make those decisions is the key factor in all the things that we've been talking about this evening uh, or morning, wherever you are in the world. And so it's, uh, so yeah, that's what I would say about that. Well, Jordan, you and I could be, not be more different as artists. <laughs> the work we make looks nothing <laughs> like each other, but you and I are very similar in that we have a very solid experience drawing from models, drawing from life and self-portraits and all that stuff. But the thing is, both of us work from photos a lot. I mean, these drawings that I was showing you guys earlier, it is not practical for me to draw these from life. I mean, Sheila doesn't live where I live. What am I going to drive an hour every time I want to make a drawing of her? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. And so I think for a lot of artists, it really is somewhat a matter of practicality, especially when you're drawing humans, because paying a model is expensive. I mean, rightfully so. I mean, it's a hard job and they deserve that. But it's like, I just can't afford that. Like, I, I need the convenience of the photography, I think, for me to really understand. Let's see. Crystal is saying, oh, we're the dynamic duo. I love that. <laughs> Very cool. Sweet. And you checked out our critique video. Yeah, if you guys have not looked, we just released a how to critique art video. And it's got a little, it's got a lot of cool stories in there, especially from my teaching practice, which is really cool. Uh, and Crystal stayed for Jordan's smile. I know we're all captivated by his smile as well. <laughs> Scotus Glenn is That's saying so there's a big distinction to be made between photorealism and simply drawing in a naturalistic observed way. People see differently than cameras. Oh, I really like that. That's a great, really succinct way to put it. So 10,000 Crows, I want to show you an example of when it's a good time to use a photo. So this is our gouache tutorial which you can find in the painting tutorials playlist. And so Alex Rowe wanted to do an illustration of the legend of Sleepy Hollow. Okay, so he's going, okay, Sleepy Hollow. I need a graveyard, <laughs> I need a church, I need something that looks sort of spooky. And so this is the final illustration that he ended up doing. And so what we actually did 
was we went to a graveyard and we checked out all the gravestones and we walked around and we took millions and millions of photographs. Jordan, why do you think it matters that we actually went to the graveyard? Because I could right now Google graveyard and thousands of images of gravestones would pop up and I could just download them. I'd be all set to go. But we drove to a cemetery and we did this. Why do you think that matters? Um, it's it's the difference between something that's artificial and real. Um, I'll try and compare it to, some, to something. Like, let's say you meet someone online and just you only know their experience from, you know, the video chat or texting or whatever. It's very different than when you meet them in real life. And oftentimes, you know, a lot of people would be intimidated because like, oh, they're going to be so different or whatever. And it's the same kind of thing. You could look at a graveyard on any image, on any movie or whatever, but there's something about being there and having that experience that makes it so different. Um, just like being in the snow and seeing the snow or two, you know, seeing it through like a TV screen is two totally different things. You don't understand how cold it is or how to layer up. You don't understand that wind and how that's, you know, you know, how you just want to get back inside and sit by the fire and, you know, all the little all the little situations like that. And there's certain things that are, are hard to notice if you just have a photo. Um, you know, the sounds, the, uh, the animals that are around, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, all incredibly important when you're trying to tell a story and have it resonate with people. And another thing is that every time I've gone on a photo shoot to shoot reference photos, so for example, Alex and I, we went to the cemetery and we knew, oh, we want to do gravestones. Okay, that's really straightforward. But sometimes you find, like, there were some weird gravestones there. Like, there was one gravestone, it just said mother. There was nothing else on it. And I found that so beautiful as an image. And if we hadn't gone to that graveyard, we would never have seen that. We also found one, if you guys look at the illustration, I know it's a little hard to see, but on the far right of the illustration, there is a tree trunk that is growing around a gravestone. And we saw that in real life and thought, wow, that's weird. Okay, let's put that into the illustration. And the thing is, if we hadn't done that, we would never have had those little details because you don't come up with that type of stuff totally on your own. Let's see, Asa yeah. saying, how would you go about doing a drawing out of imagination that captures that imaginary figure's emotion? Well, I would say it really, really depends on what type of image you're trying to do, but I think I would not underestimate the importance of the gesture of a figure to show emotion. You know a little bit about that, Jordan, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to think about that. How would you go about doing a drawing out of imagination? You know, um, art imitates life. Um, as we've kind of been saying, in a situation where I'm trying to draw from my imagination, I would actually get up and do the pose or make the expression or whatever. Um, I know a lot of animators who sit with a mirror next to their desk while they're working, and if they're ever trying to make a funny expression or a sad expression or whatever they're trying to do, they'll look at the mirror and they'll superimpose that type of reference into their drawing, even if they're drawing a fish, you know, it doesn't really matter. And, uh, or if I'm trying to do a cool pose, maybe I'll get up and do the pose. Um, like there are some, I remember when I was trying to understand weight and balance and how to put that in a figure and the hit, it was like a contrapostal pose. So one of the hips was like super far out and I was like, I don't know how that works from my head. And so I had to get up and actually do the pose and just put it in my drawing. So if you have no reference for whatever reason, which is very unique, then <laughs> do something like that. I think that would help. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing that I do in the classroom when we're drawing the nude model and the students are always so embarrassed to do this, but I do it and then makes them feel better. I say, guys, get into the pose that the model is in. I want you to feel the weight on your leg and I want you to feel that twist in her body. And so sometimes if you experience what that figure is doing, you're gonna understand better how to articulate that. WES is saying, do you think we need art critics, not professors critiquing art, but people like Jerry Saltz? I mean, I think we do. I think that they serve a completely different purpose and place. Again, another video <laughs> needs to be produced to address that. Guys are giving us great ideas for future videos. I'm going to write that one down. Okay, and let's see. Oh, I guess Kareth is talking about keeping the art market alive. 
lot of demand from the buyers, what type of art is quote good. Yeah, a lot of people want to be told this is good. This is not good because <laughs> you don't have to think so much for yourself mm -hmm. if you can just do that instead. So I hope you guys will visit artprof.org and check out some more of our free resources because there's actually more on artprof.org that you will not get on our YouTube channel. So hopefully you guys will take some time and look at that. And if you are not subscribed to our channel, we hope you will so you can continue getting free resources to grow as an artist. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters who keep us up and running. Thank you to all of you guys in the chat who gave such thoughtful comments. We will see you guys next time. Bye.